Welcome, listeners, to the Everlasting Stories Podcast. Brought to you by Sick Semper Serpent Books in Minneapolis, Minnesota. I'm your host, Michael Strand, Managing Editor. And on today's episode, we're bringing to you a fantastic piece of spiritual sci-fi, the fifth installment in the Titan Station series, Maitreya. Now, Maitreya was the name ascribed to what the Buddha would reincarnate into after he had died in this world. He said that he would return in the far future as a bodhisattva named Maitreya, or loving friend and that he would serve as a means to the enlightenment of the entire species by saving the entire species in this incredible transformative event, um, still yet far in the future. And it was that little piece of uh, prophecy uh, included in the Lotus Sutra that inspired me to write the Titan Station series and is where we have finally ended up after uh, several stories. Um, this is the fifth installment and the mid-season break, and we will finally get to our mysterious destination, Maitreya. On our next installment of the podcast, we will be beginning a brand new series called The News from Crate by Nathaniel Hicklin. It is part sci-fi, part comedy, part absurdist fantasy, and it is really unique and fascinating. It's about a young woman who um, inherits a house from her uncle in this weird town called Crate, and from the moment she arrives, um, fascinating and bizarre things begin to happen, and they just compound and compound and compound until you have this incredible mystery on your hands. And um, it's deftly written. It is um, funny as well as um, really, really touching. And I'm looking forward to bringing to you the first six episodes in um, the next series run here on the podcast. Don't worry, Titan Station will be back uh, probably later in the winter or uh, next spring. It depends on how long it takes to finish writing the series. Um, But we'll bring that to you on the podcast as soon as it's done. Um, And we have many fantastic titles coming up for you in the meantime. If you like what you hear, you can gain access to this story and the entire written archive by becoming a patron of Six Semper Serpent at the $1 a month level. And if you would like early access to future episodes of this podcast, simply sign up at the $3 a month level and you can hear stories weeks before everyone else. In the Everlasting Stories Archive and on this podcast, you will find fun, progressive shorts from science fiction and fantasy to mystery and steampunk. In other words, modern pulp fiction. If you've been enjoying the sweet jams I've been playing alongside Titan Station for the podcast, you should check out Caitlin Shepard's music, a.k.a. Binkadink, at binkadink.bandcamp.com. You can find this song and many more just there for the taking. You can pay what you want, and if you spread her music around, she'll love you for it forever. And it is great. Once again, this is Titan Station, number five, Maitreya, by Michael Strand, and it begins right now. Terence remained alert while Ben and Sarah slept in their pods. He didn't mind the isolation. Eighteen months is a long time for a human being to be alone, but for him, it was the perfect opportunity to catch up on three hundred years of reading. If he were to be any use to his human friends, he
he had to be ready to act as their guide in the futuristic world they'd be walking into once they arrived at Saturn, a task he took as seriously as maintaining the Pequod and her sleeping crew, even though he could monitor the whole ship from the recesses of circuit boards and sensors, Terence preferred to take holographic form. He wandered the various sections of the little spacecraft, checking readouts and moodily staring out the transparent metal viewports. He conjured holographic versions of his favorite books, leaving them strewn about the ship in piles, as though he were a mad professor, knee-deep in a second PhD. Often, he'd crank up the music and listen to favorites like The Grateful Dead and Jimi Hendrix over the sound system at volumes that would make human ears bleed. He was becoming an expert on holographic air guitar. More than once, he conjured 50 copies of himself to hold one man's symposia on the merits of interstellar colonization or the plausibility of faster-than-light travel. His data was scant, though, Despite the fact that the ship came loaded with a tremendous amount of information spanning the centuries they'd spent sleeping, very little data existed regarding the interstellar project or the mysterious Dr. Havel. Someone obviously didn't want them knowing too much, or didn't want secret information falling into the wrong hands should the mission to rescue them fail. Either way, it made him uneasy. Terence couldn't send a signal, either. He wanted to confirm their destination, but communications had been locked, not fried, purposefully locked. Someone also didn't want him calling for SOS. This made him exceptionally uneasy. One of the few pieces of extent information was the location of Maitreya, the epicenter of the faster-than-light colonization effort. Once he'd activated the Pequod, an autonomous process had charted a course, he didn't even need to drive. Weeks passed, then months, and then a year. And then, while in the middle of a rousing game of chess against himself, he was winning, he received a communication. Signal check. This is Maitreya Station. We have you on our sensors as rescue and recovery vehicle B-13. Please verify. Even though Terrence saw the station on long-range sensors, the signal still made him tingle with surprise and excitement. Despite being just a ghost trapped within machinery, the prospect of meeting, living, breathing people again filled him with an unexpected sense of warmth and joy. I read you, Terence replied over the comm. This is Titan Station Artificial Intelligence Terence in temporary command of the rescue vehicle B-13, renamed Pequod. Welcome back to the living, Terence. The calm tech's voice seemed to change when he heard Terence's confirmation. The young man on the other end of the line sounded relieved, as though he were speaking through a smile. We are so happy you made it. Sorry to keep you in the dark out there, but we needed to maintain operation security. <laughs> yeah, I get that, Terence replied. But I have two traumatized humans in hypersleep here with 300 years worth of questions. And we've got 300 years' worth of answers. Don't worry, the young controller replied. But I'm not the one to give those answers. You'll have to talk to Dr. Havel when you arrive. Okay, well, you have any orders for me? Yes, in 90 days, awaken your crew and begin the deceleration cycle for embarkation. You are cleared at port 108C. Okay, copy that, Maitreya. I'll make the appropriate preparations. You did well to get your crew here, unscathed, Terence. We detected the radiation from the Titan reactor explosion, and we feared the worst. Yeah, well, I don't know about unscathed, but they're alive. More than can be said for many others, sir. The Comtech said heavily. Welcome home. Home. That word had lost so much meaning since the destruction of Titan, and now... Hearing it uttered by a human voice gave him hope. Real hope. Indeed, Maitreya. See you soon. Pequot out. Ben came to while standing in his hypersleep pod. For a moment, he swayed in disorientation before remembering he was aboard the Pequod. 
The air around him felt cold, and his stomach grumbled with hunger, but he felt great compared to the state he'd been in after three centuries in the pod. He stepped out, injected himself with the inocu gun to stave off the weakness of hypersleep, and boy did it feel good. He showered off and dressed. No sooner had he stepped into his boat shoes did the chamber door chirp. Enter, he said. The door swept open, and a holographic image of Terence stood on the other side, smiling his sly Cheshire grin. We're here, buddy, Terence said, as though he were speaking to a kid late for school. You feeling okay? Oh, I'm a little hungry, but I'll be all right. Well, you can have breakfast and watch me start the deceleration process. How's Sarah? My doppelganger is greeting her presently. Are we at Saturn? <laughs> Boy, are we ever, Terence said, winking out of view. As Ben entered the common area, the sight of the Saturnian rings through the observation windows took his breath away. From this distance, the sixth planet looked like a monarch seated on an infinitely high throne. The shifting colors and storms of the planet's surface looked like liquid gold in an impossibly huge foundry. The shepherding moons shone like diamonds in the distance, framing the massive rings like the jewels of a crown. Sarah stepped into the common room and greeted Ben with a firm hug. She seemed happy to see him. Perhaps she was simply happy to be out of the pod. Either way, Ben savored the momentary feeling of warmth. She pulled her dark, half-dried hair into a ponytail and started to prepare food. She handed him a hot cup of coffee, a slight smile on her face. Ben couldn't help but remember that day he saved her from drowning in her pod and the coffee they'd shared, alone in the dark belly of Titan Station. Since then, they'd come so far. And now, finally, they would understand why they'd survived when so many others had not and the role they would play in an uncertain future. Several days passed as they decelerated towards the station. Ben and Sarah spent hours in excited conversation and making log entries to record their experiences so far. An almost party atmosphere filled the cramped cabins of the Pequod. Finally, the station came into visual range, Ben and Sarah floated in the gravity-free forward section watching its approach. The facility hung regal against the rings of Saturn, white and shining like a star, a stark contrast to the ruined Titan station which had appeared so dark and menacing above the ruined visage of Mars. The main bulk of Maitreya consisted of a huge, tube-shaped living area which slowly spun to generate gravity. Ben assumed that an entire city had been built along the curved inner surface, like the rings of Titan, but bigger, much, much bigger. A constellation of smaller, spherical installations orbited the primary structure in slow circles. Each possessed several huge ships docked at the nose, which radiated out from the central sphere in a starburst pattern. The ships looked to be under construction, their cavernous guts flashing with the slag from autonomous weldbots who zoomed in and out of view. Other vehicles moved large metal pieces from fat, open-mouthed fabrication vessels toward the half-constructed colony ships, celestial whales in a star ocean. Thousands of shuttles streaked and flashed in and out of view as they navigated the complex of inter-orbiting space installations Everything possessed a glossy, curved aesthetic. Neon lights flashed and pulsed everywhere. Obviously, life in space had evolved exponentially in the last few centuries. As they approached still closer, Ben and Sarah could see through the windows of various ships, shuttles, and stations. Snippets of life and work came into view. People living in space. Their people. As they grew closer... Maitreya became almost planetary in scale. The tube shape disappeared into a gently rounded visage, which filled the entirety of their view windows. Terence matched attitude and rotational speed. As he did so, the gravitational orientation of the Pequod changed, such that the port side now became the floor. 
Terran stocked the Pequod's starboard dorsal aperture at a mooring labeled in big block letters, 108-C. Okay, kids, we're here, Terrence exclaimed. Pick up your own trash and carry your own bags. Watch your head on the airlock, and as always, thank you for flying Terrence's interplanetary space line. Oh, whoa, the gravity's intense, Ben said, falling awkwardly into a set of controls, which started to flash and honk. Man, I can barely move. Ugh. Well... It'll get worse the further in you go, Terence said, canceling the alarm and shutting down the ship's engines. My readings say the internal gravity is at 10% greater than Earth normal. I assume the extra G-load is to climatize the crew of those colony ships to their new home. Yeah, but for you two, who are suffering from hypersleep emaciation and long-term low-G exposure, I doubt you'll be able to even stand. So how do we get out? Sarah asked. You'll have to take the ladder up through the airlock. Great, she sighed, rolling her eyes. The climb through the starboard airlock and up through the thick skin of Maitreya seemed to take forever. By the time they reached the inner aperture, Ben's arms and legs shook badly. He felt hardly able to hold on. Sweat dripped from his brow and drenched his shirt. Sarah climbed ahead of him at barely a crawl. When the inner aperture slid open, several hands reached down to haul Sarah out through the hatchway. Ben struggled with the last few rungs, reaching up feebly to meet the strong grip of his rescuers, who lifted him through the aperture. His arms creaked and protested with pain as he was lifted. When Ben emerged from the floor, the bright inner chamber blinded him. He rolled onto his back, his lungs heaving. He felt as though a fat dog were sitting on his chest, slowly crushing him. Sweat made his back feel cold against the metal decking. His bones hurt. His eyes hurt. Everything hurt. The sense of being smashed into the floor with immense force became his complete reality. Dr. Benjamin Scholl? Dr. Sarah Fitzgerald? A voice spoke from the brightness. The accent sounded unfamiliar to Ben, unlike any he'd heard on Earth or Mars. Hold still, we need to perform a medical scan. Ben's head started to clear. Yeah, okay, he mumbled. Who are you? Sarah's voice said from nearby. I'm Chief Medical Officer Charles O'Leary. One of the shadowy figures said, pointing a blurry, blinking device at Ben's chest. This is Executive Operations Officer Gwen Shikibu. She's in command of the station. And that's Centenarian Project Chief Narsal Banks. He'll be responsible for taking care of you. One of the other shadowy figures waved a warm greeting. Why can't I see? Sarah asked, starting to sound afraid. The lights here are brighter than what you're used to. Plus, the added gravity and atmospheric pressure is distorting the shape of your eyeballs, Dr. O'Leary said, quickly, moving the device over each of them head to foot. Where's Havel? Ben groaned, struggling to get up in the heavy gravity. He'd said he'd give us answers. Gwen Shikibu kneeled down and gently pressed Ben's chest, forcing him to lie flat. Save your strength. One false move and you can break a bone or damage your spine. Dr. Havel will meet you in his quarters after you've been treated. There's no rush. You're safe now. O'Leary finished his scan and addressed Officer Shikibu. Shoal has a repaired spinal hernia along with multiple fractures, and Fitzgerald has a leg fracture that needs remodulation. Both have low bone density, severely degraded muscle tone, and low red blood cell count. They'll need a few cycles in the Viv chamber before they can even walk unassisted. Officers Shikibu and O'Leary stood and motioned to the other shadowy figures further down the hallway, who stepped forward with wheelchairs to carry them. Really, it's all right. We'll answer any questions you might have. All in due time, said Narsal Banks in a kind London lilt. But please, allow us to treat you first. Ben nodded, and Sarah muttered, make it quick. The station personnel helped Ben into one of the chairs and Sarah into the other. 
Terence appeared suddenly, his hollow image popping into existence next to Sarah as the greeting party started rolling them down the bright hallway. Programs all transferred, Fitz, Terence said to Sarah. It's nice to have some serious processing power again. Do you have access to operations data? Sarah asked. Plenty, he replied. You won't believe it, Fitz. What they're doing here, it's... It's... Beyond anything ever attempted, Officer Shikibu said, completing Terence's thought. I think you'll be very impressed. Just as she said this, they rounded a corner to face a transparent wall, which offered a panoramic view of the vast inner chamber of Maitreya. Through his blurred eyes, Ben could just barely comprehend what he was seeing. It looked as though someone had scooped up an advanced city from Earth and rolled it up like a confection. The inner surface of the chamber must have covered hundreds of square kilometers and sustained a population of hundreds of thousands. Far above them, ground and buildings constituted the sky, which swept over them like the curl of a mighty wave. The magnificent tubular world seemed to be the quintessence of a bright sunny day on Earth. A profound light radiated from every street and promenade, creating a kind of ubiquitous glow which filled the entire cavernous space. Greenery and vegetation burst from everywhere. The city elements lay intertwined with the living elements until he could hardly see where the man-made structures began and organic structures ended. Lakes and rivers snaked through the superstructure, creating winding, twinkling paths that striated across the looped face of the landscape. The sight left him awed. Sarah reached out a feeble hand to grip his own. The welcoming party let them linger on the view for a few moments before continuing towards a lift that would take them to the central medical bay. When they arrived at Med Central, the staff treated the newcomers as though they were objects from a museum. Ben couldn't help but notice their whispered voices. Do you think they remember Mars before the accident? Look at their clothes and shoes. They're like something out of a hollow vid. Do you think they'll let me write a paper on them? Medical Chief O'Leary rounded on the crowd and glowered at his staff. Anyone not treating the newcomers needs to leave. A disappointed chorus of young voices groaned in protest. You know the drill. The last remaining centenarian subjects are being awakened to complete colonization. You act like these are the first 300-year-old people you've ever seen. One by one, the disappointed staff left Med Central until only a few remained. I'm sorry about that. The younger ones are curious about the past. All of them were born here, bred to colonize another world. They forget themselves when there's excitement. What's next? Sarah asked sharply, starting to lose patience. I'm in pain over here? Yes, indeed. Dr. O'Leary and several aides helped Ben and Sarah out of their chairs and into cushioned beds ringed by panels of blinking lights. When they were settled, a bubble of transparent material emerged to cover each bed. Ben looked over to see Sarah in what looked like a hypersleep pod. Ugh, no more hypersleep. Ben groaned. Hardly, said O'Leary's voice over the calm in the pod. This is kind of the opposite, actually. In the Viv chamber, you will have your vital systems stimulated and repaired. A few hours in there, and you'll feel right as rain. Will it hurt? Not at all. Ben closed his eyes and relaxed. A low, deep hum filled the chamber, accompanied by a bright opulescence, which flickered and flashed through the glass. Ben felt his bones vibrate with a pleasant tingle. His muscles contracted and relaxed, as though gentle hands were massaging him all over. In minutes, he fell asleep. After what must have been a few hours, the glass bubble retracted, inundating him with the cool, sterile air of Med Central. He felt groggy, but pleasantly so, and then he looked down and gasped. His muscles stood out on his arms and forearms, he pulled up his shirt to find a rippling set of abs. Damn, I was never this ripped, even back in the day. Ben sat up without thinking, realizing only after a moment that the heavy gravity hardly affected him now. In fact, 
He felt strong. His eyes had stopped hurting, and he could see clearly, arguably clearer than before. He admired his new and improved body for several moments before Sarah got his attention. Hey, good looking, she said, swinging her legs over the side of the chamber and giving him a once-over. Ben glanced at her and immediately had to scoop his jaw off the floor. Sarah's skin had regained a rich caramel luster. Her dark hair shone and bounced with volume. Her emaciated, sunken features had been replaced by full cheeks and a gentle smile. Curves filled out her t-shirt and pants quite pleasantly. Ditto! Doc, what did you do to us? Sarah asked in awe. And can you do it more? The Viv Chamber stimulated your body's natural rejuvenation processes. It's standard procedure for any centenarian subject coming out of long-term hypersleep. Ben's stomach growled loud enough for everyone to hear. Um, it's been 300 years since I've eaten anything that didn't come out of a package, so can we have dinner? No, Sarah said bluntly, growing serious again. I want to talk to Haval. Now. Well, you're both in luck. Dr. Havel is waiting for you, with dinner, Narsal Banks said gently. I believe tonight's menu is paneer makani and saffron rice. According to our records, Dr. Fitzgerald, it's your favorite. Dr. Arthur Havel's quarters took up a generous portion of a long, simple hallway in the guts of the science and administration section of Maitreya. Narsal Banks escorted Sarah, Ben, and Terence alone because Officer Shikibu needed to return to commanding the station, and Dr. O'Leary had duties in Med Central. All right, here's where I'll leave you for now, Banks said in his good-natured accent. When you're done, I'll be right back here and... We'll take you to your respective quarters. Thank you, Dr. Banks, Sarah said. Bah, think nothing of it, he replied warmly, and call me Nossil. And with that, he pressed the alert button beside the door, which slid open a moment later, revealing a spacious, tastefully decorated sitting area. Havel has been waiting for you for a very long time, he said, gesturing for them to enter. The strange trio stepped into Havel's quarters, Quiet electronic beats and melodies played from a music source nearby. Much of the space remained in shadow, the low lighting a welcome reprieve from Maitreya's sunshine-bright inner chamber. Before them, a set of couches surrounded a glass and stainless steel coffee table, lit with a pair of simple brass lamps. A shadowy stairway led up from behind the sitting area to another level beyond. Ben glanced to the top of the stairs to see a tall, thin man in khaki pants and a black sweater, wearing a long white coat staring down at them. He'd styled his snow-white hair and beard such that not a single hair lay out of place. On his nose, he wore a pair of antique, large-framed glasses, clearly a style choice in an age of advanced medicine. Welcome, friends, to my Maitreya. Havel's voice possessed a timber and gravitas that scarcely escaped notice, and had a regal strength to it, a buttery intonation that sought to disguise a hard, unfathomable intellect. Ben felt conflict rise within him, a dizzying sense of curiosity and anger. When he looked to Sarah's face, though, he saw only anger. But I can see you are conflicted, he continued. Come, sit. I'd rather stand, Sarah replied coldly. Please, I will explain everything. You left us to die out there, Sarah's chill deepened. Humanity left you to die, Havel said quietly, stepping down the staircase. I broke explicit solar law by violating the Martian exclusion zone to recover you. Confusion tempered the anger in Sarah's brow. Please, Havel repeated. What is happening is complex, far more complex than you know. If we are ignorant, it is because you have chosen to leave us in the dark, she said forcefully. Havel flinched. I apologize. Forced ignorance is 
never dignified. But you must know that it is for your safety. He extended his hand again. Please, come eat. I will tell you everything. Sarah didn't move. Dr. Fitzgerald, Havel removed his glasses to clean them on his shirt. I promise I will tell you the complete truth in every detail if you promise to listen. His ice-blue eyes seemed to cut into Sarah, unblinking. Ben could feel the struggle within his friend, her rage at the death of her daughter, her isolation in a future she never wanted to be a part of, her fear at being conscripted into something she didn't choose. Terence glanced at Ben, his heavily lidded holographic eyes communicating volumes, but he said nothing. And then Sarah broke her gaze and looked at her shoes. Ben put his hand on her shoulder. She reached up and squeezed it. I'll listen, she said quietly. The three climbed the stairs behind Havel. The upper level of his quarters bubbled out into space and possessed a panoramic view of Saturn and the ship fields surrounding Maitreya. From this vantage, Ben could clearly see the robotic crews constructing the big colony ships. He felt like a Roman commander overseeing his legion. Below them, a floor of stars shone through transparent decking, framing a moderate glass dining table set for three. Terence, of course, didn't eat. Steaming dishes of rice and curry sat at the table's center. The smell of spices made Ben ravenous. Havel motioned for them to sit, only taking his place after they'd found their seats. He gestured to Sarah to pass her plate, and he served her a generous helping of saffron rice and spicy curry from the terrines near him. This recipe is nearly 800 years old, he said, dripping the last bits of curry from the serving spoon before handing the plate back to Sarah. Then he took Ben's plate, freely offered. I hope to eat it on a new world someday soon. Uh, so what's the name of this new world? Ben asked, accepting his food with a polite nod. Duat. Ooh, the Egyptian paths of death, Terence interjected. Home of the gods Osiris, Anubis, Thoth, Horus, Hanor, and Mat. Yes, indeed, Havel replied, raising a glass of ice water in cheers to his guest. A divine name for humanity's last hope. And why is that, Professor? Sarah asked in an unfriendly tone. Why is it our last hope? For the first time, a sense of human frailty overtook Havel's straight-backed frame. He looked old, much older than his seventy-odd years suggested. He set down his fork. Please, continue eating he said emphatically. Whilst I explain. Havel took a deep breath and began his story. <sighs> to understand what happened to Mars, you must understand my life's work and the functioning of the Majiro Drive, the propulsion which makes the ten light-year journey to Duat possible. As a young scientist, I worked on Mars with my mentor, Shigeru Majiro. He was a genius of physics and engineering, like none humanity had ever seen. I looked up to him like a father and spent every waking moment working to bring his dream into being. We spent nearly a decade developing a way to fold space-time, which, in essence, would allow matter to be transported from one place to another in the blink of an eye. At first... The scientific community called us fools. We had to fight for scraps when it came to funding. But in time, we made progress. Enough progress to get the attention of the Martian government. In 2183, the year of the event that destroyed Mars, we completed the most advanced FTL lab ever created in New Musk City, the capital of Mars. I felt so proud of my mentor and our efforts to bring humanity out of the cradle and into a larger universe. Havel stopped to take a drink of water, 
his mouth dry. Some of the Majiro team, with me as its leader, were sent here, to Saturn, to create a deep space reception program. We were planning to drop the travel time from Earth to the outer solar system from a couple of years to a few minutes. Though we hadn't even performed our first living tissue test, my mentor was so sure that the process would be safe for people, he sent us ahead to set up a lab for testing human transport. We were in hypersleep, still months out from Saturn when the disaster happened. A veil trailed off and sighed. You see... The Majiro Drive allows for the transportation of matter and energy through the use of an artificial singularity of folded space-time. Or rather, we create a singularity which tunnels into another universe where we are able to siphon off an infinite amount of zero-point energy just for the tiniest microsecond, which we then use to fold space-time. Through folding space-time using advanced full-range geometry, we created a variable field of effect, which we then could use to instantaneously transport matter great distances. Once we'd worked out the fundamental physics, the process turned out to be safe, simple even. We had safely created the Majiro field in the lab and had already transported many, many objects by the time of the disaster. At first we transported small metal spheres across the lab, but eventually we were blinking sensory probes from one end of Mars to the other, and we'd never had a single problem. Dr. Majiro decided that the first living being to be transported using the Majiro effect would be his prize Ainu pup, Yuki. If the test went well with the dog, he volunteered to be the second. He had complete faith in the technology. The dog was placed into the translocation chamber. The team counted down the sequence... And then, boom, Terence said quietly. Havel nodded his head gravely. Boom, indeed. The team that survived, my team, spent years trying to figure out what went wrong. We had no scientific explanation as to why a 40-pound dog would cause a planet-ending explosion like the one observed on Mars. I mean... So much energy was released. It changed the orbit of the planet. It melted and fused the crust. It caused such intense stress to Mars that massive earthquakes will perpetuate for at least a million years. Much of the atmosphere was blown away. It's uninhabitable. But why? Havel suddenly grew almost manic in his energy. How could this be? I became obsessed I dedicated my life to discovering what went wrong with my mentor's research. At first, the solution eluded me. Nothing within physics could explain it. So, perhaps the solution wasn't scientific. What if the failure had some kind of spiritual solution? Spiritual? Sarah asked incredulously. Yes, quite literally spiritual. You see, what we didn't take into consideration is the weight of a soul. Soul weight? Terence scoffed. Yes, a living being possesses more than just matter. It possesses life force, a living spirit, an incarnated soul. In this world, the physical world, such a thing is unmeasurable. The best detectors in the world cannot say where the soul resides or if it perpetuates beyond death. But anyone can see the manifestation of the soul. Human creativity, art, emotion, thought, feelings, these are all evidence of the spirit. We discovered that the soul has a kind of shape, a weight, proportional to its complexity, within a non-physical sphere of existence. The soul exists there as a structure in another universe, which interacts with matter in this universe through a biochemical gateway of flesh. If you try to transport a physical being in possession of a soul, using the Majiro effect, a bifurcation transpires, which releases a mind-boggling amount of energy. 
Um, even a dog? Ben blurted innocently. I mean, does a dog have a soul? Havel looked mock wounded and said, especially dogs. And then he took a few bites of now cold curry and continued. Once we had discovered the reason for the disaster, we began to engineer solutions. After just a few years, we'd grown close to figuring out how to make the drive work as a practical mode of travel, even interstellar travel. But, he sighed, that's when the war started. After the destruction of Mars, the solar economy collapsed and space travel within the solar system dropped dramatically. The population on Earth, thus far under control, began to spike again. Factions developed, armies rose, even after being illegal for nearly a hundred years. The war dragged on for a decade. Much of Earth that had been slowly healed since the disastrous 21st century was again lost to nuclear weapons and desertification. All interest in the Majiro Drive died along with Mars, which became a taboo zone, a living tomb kept free of military control. It was then that Dr. Narsil Banks and myself decided to create the Centenarian Project. Both of us felt the hard edge of mortality cutting into the flesh of the future, and we sought to use hypersleep as a way to preserve our knowledge for a time when humanity would need it again. We volunteered to be put into hypersleep, along with some key members of the Majiro Initiative, until a future date when the war was over and the effort to perfect faster-than-light travel could commence again. I had a dream of colonizing another world using my mentor's technology. I knew that others would share that dream someday. But at that time, the whole of Earth hated and mistrusted the Majiro technology, and we had no choice but to sleep and hope that humanity someday changed its mind. Havel stopped speaking. He rose and stepped to a sleek cabinet and withdrew three spotless glasses and a bottle of dark red liquid. The wine is made from grapes grown right here on Maitreya, he said as he filled the glasses. This bottle is a 2478. Then he took his place and continued. We spent eight decades asleep until we were finally awakened. It was then, two hundred years ago, that we began the plans for Maitreya, the shipyards, and a colonization project of the closest human habitable world, Duat. The reason for our awakening was practical. The Earth was dying, or, should I say, is dying. The war and the decades of chaos that followed it completely acidified the oceans and ruined the soil. Every animal bigger than a rat was extinct. There's some algae and some hearty grasses, a few species of insect and cactus, but the earth is no longer a living biosystem. Since the early 21st century, we knew of Duat and its habitability, but getting there, and more so colonization, remained science fiction. Now it's become an absolute necessity of human survival. Once awakened, we focused completely on solving the problem of soul weight and fixing the fatal flaw in the Majiro Drive. If a dog spirit caused the destruction of Mars, a human soul might destroy the entire solar system. We had no more room for mistakes. As I worked on the problem with my team, we also identified others who might be able to assist in the colonization effort. We recruited these people and placed them in hypersleep as well. In essence, we started hoarding geniuses, keeping safe humanity's best scientists for a time when they would be most needed. Havel paused for a moment and scrutinized his guests. You were both known to be in stasis on Titan, and we wanted to rescue you for our team because of your respective expertise in artificial intelligence and terraforming. 
We petitioned to rescue you then, two centuries ago, but we couldn't get political clearance to violate Martian space. We had to wait. Finally, we made a breakthrough in the research. We were able to find an ancient solution for separating the human soul from its physical frame so that the body could be transported. How? Sarah asked, finally engaged. The mode of human consciousness in this world is electrochemical. Therefore, the solution is chemical. We use a drug to separate the soul from the body, something shamans on Earth have been said to do for millennia. And then the body is put into hypersleep, dramatically reducing the metabolic rate and increasing the duration of the drug-induced soul separation. We call this process of removing the consciousness from its physical form deep diving. All physical objects are but pasteboard masks, Terence muttered, almost to himself. If man will strike, strike through the mask. Precisely, Terence, precisely, Havel said emphatically. Once the spirit is in deep dive and the body is in hypersleep, the ship makes an automated jump using the Majiro drive. Once through the jump, the bodies are reanimated and the chemical separation allowed to wear off. The soul then rejoins the body ten light years away. From the perspective of the ship and its sleeping crew, no time at all passes from the moment the ship leaves the solar system to the moment it appears around Duat. However, for us, the objective observer, the ship disappears for ten years before reappearing. Relativity cannot be fully outrun. Once we'd made the discovery that would enable the colonization of Duat, I'd volunteered to be placed back into hypersleep until I was needed again. Since that time, I've spent centuries in and out of hypersleep, along with Narsu and others, overseeing the construction of Maitreya and engineering the colonization plan. Okay, so why did you decide to retrieve us now, after all this time? Terence asked. Each of you is special. Terence, you are the only known artificial intelligence in history to possess a human soul. And Dr. Fitzgerald, that means that you are the only person in history to create a computer capable of incarnating a human soul. And Dr. Scholl, when Mars died and Earth devolved into war, so too did the science of terraforming. You are the last living person with practical knowledge of how living biosystems function on a planetary scale. Though a great deal of time has passed, and the entirety of Earth civilization is now oriented toward the effort to leave the system, old taboos are hard to break. Mars is a tomb an off-limits place. No one goes there. It is still highly illegal to violate Martian space. So, this time, we did not ask for permission and broke solar law to get you. We designed and constructed an especially stealthy, radio-silent, automated craft to collect you, the ship you call Pequod. I, myself, only just emerged from a long stretch of hypersleep to oversee your rescue. And now, finally, we are entering the final phases of the colonization project. I'm sure blowing up Titan was the low-profile rescue you were going for, Terence said, snorting in laughter. Yes, the explosion was unforeseen. We were afraid you'd been killed, though I had faith in Terence to see you through. Fortunately, Earth media has framed the explosion near Mars as the result of a natural degradation in Titan's reactors, which is true from a certain point of view. So, why build Maitreya way out here? Sarah asked. Is it in case there is another disaster? That's it, precisely. If we have any more... Incidents with the Majiro Drive, there's nothing to destroy. 
all jumps take place in the vast void of space on the far side of Saturn. What does it mean? The word Maitreya, Ben asked. The word comes from ancient Buddhist myth. Maitri means loving kindness, and Maitreya is the name attributed to what would be the Buddha's next incarnation. At the end of his life, the Buddha said that after he died, the world would eventually forget his teachings and fall into disarray and war. In that far-off future, at a time when humans lived for hundreds of years, all life in this solar system would die. The Buddha said that during this troubled future, he would return in the form of a bodhisattva named Maitreya, who would save living beings from extinction. This station was designed to be a lifeboat for the species. Even without Earth, it is self-sustaining, the nucleus of a new future. I felt Maitreya to be an appropriate name for this structure. Has anyone actually visited Duat? Sarah asked eagerly. A brave few souls have made the trip, or I should say, a few brave bodies have made the trip, minus their soul. The two-decade round trip is costly, however. Mostly, we observe the planet by remote, using quantum entanglement for instant communication. Would you like to see it? They all nodded. Havel pulled a device from his pocket and pressed a button. One of the large observation windows nearby shifted to become a view screen. A shining, purple-blue planet appeared. From their orbital vantage point, they watched in real time as the face of the world slowly transitioned from daytime to night below them. White clouds streaked the face of regal purplish oceans. Unfamiliar continents harbored dark jungles and prairies teeming with alien life. A new world, expansive and strange. Sarah raised her eyebrows, impressed. We were theorizing about entanglement tech for instant communications between Earth and Mars, but we could never get it to work. Humanity has perfected many technologies over the last few centuries. Our species has evolved. In a way, we are more prepared to live on Duat now than Earth. You and me and a few other members of the Centenarian Project are the last remaining natural humans. Everyone born today is genetically modified to handle the pathogens and atmospheric pressure, light, and gravity of Duat. And our space structures reflect that change. That's why I keep my quarters here, on the outer edge of Maitreya, where the gravity isn't quite so strong and the lights don't have to be quite so bright. From here, I can monitor the entire colonization project whilst Gwen runs day-to-day -day station operations. The Vive Chamber means that I can live quite comfortably on my Maitreya, of course, but I prefer the settings of Old Earth. So is Narsal going to, like, be our boss, or are you? Ben asked. Narsal is my oldest friend, and I trust him with my life. He will help you integrate into the Centenarian Project and explain to you the role you will play. We certainly have a use for each of your specialities. I still can't get my head around this whole soul separation thing, Sarah said, shaking her head. It sounds more like magic than science. The ancients would have certainly called everything we do here magic. But I assure you, it is both scientific and safe. Once you've settled in, you will experience your first deep dive. My description of the experience is insufficient. It's best you see for yourself. Narsal and O'Leary will oversee your dive training. Ben and Sarah sat back in front of empty plates. Ben felt as though some gnawing hunger within him had finally been satisfied and it had nothing to do with the curry. He gazed at the image of Duat on the viewer. His head swam with more questions. So, are we totally abandoning Earth? Sarah said quickly, as though reading Ben's mind. Or will there be efforts to fix it? 
What's the overall colonization plan? What's the current status of humanity? What's the biodiversity of Duat? How exactly does the Majiro dive work? Please, please. It's getting late, and you've had a very full day, Havel said, standing up to end her line of inquiry. The Vive Chamber treatments make you feel great, but it is in fact quite draining. You must rest, and we will talk more later, I assure you. Narsil can explain the finer details of anything I've said tonight, and I am certain you will have many more questions. But for now, it is time to rest. Ben, Terence, and Sarah stood up as well. Havel pressed a button on the table and informed Narsil that their dinner had ended. I hope that we can become friends, though I know this will take time, Havel said as he led them down the stairs and to the door. Thank you, Dr. Havel. For explaining, Sarah said. I feel a little better knowing the truth about why we are here. Havel smiled gently. Again, I am truly sorry for your trauma and sorrow, for your loss. He clasped her hands. In a way, we are brethren, children of the 22nd century, trapped in the 25th. Please know that your sacrifices, the sacrifices of all, were not for nothing. He squeezed her hands tight. We are on the cusp of the most profound and important event in human history, the advent of a multi-solar civilization. folks that's tonight's story i hope you enjoyed listening to it as much as i enjoyed reading and producing it once again you heard titan station part five maitreya by michael strand that's me produced for six semper serpent and published in the everlasting stories archive in 2018 On the next episode, we will be taking a break from Titan Station while I write more of it and beginning a brand new series titled The News from Crate by Nathaniel Hicklin. The first entry is called Welcome to Crate, and it's going to be fantastic, so stay tuned for that. If you enjoyed this story and you would like more, you can read it now and forever and the Everlasting Stories archive found at patreon.com slash sixsemperserpent. You can get full access to this story and the entire archive by subscribing at the $1 a month level. And you can get early access to new episodes of this podcast a month before everyone else at the $3 a month level. The text for this story and the audio for this podcast were produced by me, Michael Strand, managing editor for Six Semper Serpent. The publisher of this podcast is T. Martin Krauss, editor-in-chief at Six Semper Serpent. And the music for this episode was produced by Binkadink, a.k.a. Caitlin Shepard. Search for her music at binkadink.bandcamp.com. Thank you so much for listening. And if you have been, Thanks for subscribing. We'll see you next time on the Everlasting Stories Podcast. <laughs>